You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services. Nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. The following message contains a special offer for listeners of this station. Are you a man over 40? Are you constantly looking for the nearest bathroom? Do you wake up multiple times a night to use the bathroom? Right now, Perfect Prostate is sending out free bottles of their groundbreaking new formula to listeners of this station. Perfect Prostate formula was developed by medical doctor Mitchell Fleischer, and its ingredients have been clinically studied to reduce your frequent nighttime bathroom visits and promote healthy urine flow. Right now, preferred customers get their first bottle of Perfect Prostate absolutely free. There's nothing to lose. Perfect Prostate is guaranteed to reduce that constant urge to use the bathroom, especially at night, and promote healthy urine flow. Don't wait. Call now for your free bottle. 
Just pay shipping and processing. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Supplies are limited. One free bottle per household. Call now. Dial 1-800-675-0251. That's 1-800-675-0251. Hey, folks. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, Dr. Richard Harden. We are on the same mission, which is Waking Up America. We just have different paths. So stay tuned for some information on how you can keep up with Richard and all his work. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Every day, the men and women of the United States Marine Corps stand ready to defend the American way of life. The few, the proud, the Marines. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. You are listening live to the VO at VO Show. Disrespectful to the executive branch. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty... There's no vice. Don't sign the damn deal. And the president won't. Therefore, I do not believe that the majority can vote a man's life or property or freedom away from him. And we're live here on the Vito Vito Show. I'm Vito. I'm Vito. And we are bringing you the perspectives of two college age millennial conservative libertarians out of liberal hellhole. Brooklyn, New York, where we're committed to defending the principles of freedom, liberty, and individualism. We all know punches here on the show. Uh, no, none whatsoever, and tonight we got a good show for you. we got a friend of the show. He called in uh, last week. He had some tef- technical difficulties. He called in last week. Good friend of the show, Frank Minotaur. He's the author of the book, uh, The Ultimate Man Survival Guide, Recovering the Lost Art of Manhood. Let's talk about how men can be men, Vito. We've uh-huh. lost that way. I like that. Uh, man, so we're gonna man. we're gonna bring on Frank uh, later on. We have a pre-recorded interview with him, and he was absolutely wonderful to have mm-hmm. on the show when he talks about the book. And we're gonna talk about later on in the program uh, how there was a push by many in the New York Times, many in the Washington Post, many in the liberal media, many movements, MoveOn.org, etc., all pushing their last hope for Donald Trump not to be president of the United States. They're trying to get electors, GOP electors, to throw their votes away when they go cast uh, the Electoral College vote. So we're going to talk about if that's the right thing to do. We're going to talk about this notion of the popular vote. Does Donald Trump have a mandate? So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, And I'm going to read you an article from the New York Times. Bear with me. I'm going to read you an article from the New York Times. We're going to talk about this crazy stuff. And we're going to see if it's even right. Uh, And what what does it matter about the popular vote, if it matters at all. All right, so we got a good interview with Frank Vito. and, And, you know, we had a... An interesting conversation with him last time. Uh, and we spoke about, is it right that men today can't be who they want to be? You know, they've sort of lost their way. It's the pussification of the American male, you know? Uh, and it's really like masculinity is treated as a bad thing. And this notion of femininity is just put on a pedestal and is thoroughly accepted. You know, you know like on TV shows, mm-hmm. they say men got to get in touch with their emotions. They got to get all, you know, and that's all fine and all. But at the same time, the idea of a man... You know, playing sports and the idea of a man. Yeah, beards and lumberjacks. Beards, lumberjack, beer. talking about women and, you know. You know, being a man? Yeah. Like, that's just, that is just not allowed anymore. Uh, while it's okay for women to run around, sleep with everybody, if you think about it, uh, it's considered a sense of empowerment. Uh, you have these slut walks going around. I'm sure we've mm-hmm. all seen those things. So it, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and, and one has to wonder, where do these people get off? And it's all all this feminists and 
this new modern feminism, and I think the hypocrites. Well, keep in mind that feminism has it, it sort of changed its way. Well, that's why I said modern feminism. Well, yeah. Of course, years ago, fighting for women's equal rights and all that good stuff, that's fine. But when that turns into not just women want equal rights, but now today it's women wanting to be much better than men, and then women running on false premises that say women don't get paid the same, which is a, a lie. I think you could make so, you you could divide the women's liberation movement. I call it the women's libation movement because I think honestly they are so drunk right now in the way that they're running around trying to get their ideas passed. But the idea, the women liberation movement. Into three stages. Three, three, um... You broke it down for us? Yeah. Oh, uh, you take the it. first part, and that's like the Susan B. Anthony's and the, you know, the women's suffrage movement and stuff like that. From years time. ago. But keep in mind also, and if you read your history books, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see that women, specifically the, the homely women, were the ones who were leading the prohibition movement in the country. Did you know, by the way, Vito, fun mm-hmm. fact for you, that pinball, pinball, was illegal in New York City from the 1940s up until this recently, 19, well, not recently, but 1976. For like 30 years? For 30 years, it was illegal, and it was pushed by women who were concerned that their men would take their paychecks and gamble on pinball machines because huh. there was a history. And throughout the country, if you look at the history of pinball, it's actually a pretty interesting history because for years, pinball has been targeted by organized crime as being a rigged game and whatnot. Oh. So they've actually banned it. they treated it like it's gambling. That's interesting. And they used to gamble pinball. I think Ohio is. itself, I could be wrong if it was Ohio. I'm going to double check that. But one of these states had a full bone blend. And they just recently repealed. Really? Yeah. Because all I know about pinball is pinball with No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Indiana. It was a county in Indiana. There we go. Now it's coming back. Can't county in Indiana. Pinball. Just like just last year, they repealed the pinball. And it's ban. driven by women. That... Going against your freedoms, literally, you can't play pinball. That just sounds ridiculous. Well, there was a, you know, the movement for that was that the men are, you know, it was considered a game of sin. It was like a vice, a vice, you know. All right, uh, so let's ban alcohol. Vice. They did. Well, they did. So, so, anyway, but keep in mind, but, ban you know, everything. Hold on. Now, the women's suffrage movement also made a lot of sense. You had women fighting for the right to vote, and you have right. women, you know, fighting to own property, even though in certain states women were allowed to own property. So. You know, uh, one has to understand that it was a slow progression. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is it aided by the women's suffrage movement? I don't know. It's a good question, and that's a good debate. Anyway, so that's pretty much the first half, which we all agree with, women getting the right to vote, eventually passing Mm -hmm. the 19th Amendment. Yep. So we get all that. Then you could divide the next part of the women's movement up to the the feminine mystique, the, the, you know, uh, women, the National Organization for Women, the, the push for women to be on the same playing field as men, Make the same as a man, whatever. But a lot of those things at the time period, of course, were social norms that were sort of falling by the wayside. You know, right. Women would basically have to, you know, they get a job, they go to school, they go to the workforce, they find a husband, they marry them, and then that's that. Right, and things are drastically different, especially in women's life, from 1950 or so, say, to today. Sure, I mean, about 60, 70 years ago. Yeah, take a look at the Mad Men era, I understand that. Mm-hmm. But lots of women who did those things were very happy. You know, and now we take a look at this new radical socialist feminism, and it's women who are, they have taken the Marxist theories, and they have just slapped it onto their brand of feminism, when they are running around saying that the the social classes that are mm-hmm. fighting one another aren't the rich and poor, it's the rich men and the poor women. You know, they're, they're stressing gender, yeah, just, like Black Lives Matter stress, just like Black Lives Matter stresses race. Yeah, they're just adding another category and putting grouping people into these different groups. Yeah. And these people are ridiculous, because you look at the, the the issues that they're driving on today, and the things they're doing, these quote-unquote protests, mm-hmm. it's absolutely ridiculous. And one of the big things I saw is when these feminists were dyeing their armpit hair, <laughs> different colors. See, I'm a woman, I can do whatever I want. Listen... I know you can do anything you want. It goes back to the whole women don't have to shave their legs. Yeah, thing you don't have to shave your legs. Okay, listen, if you look like Grizzly Adams <laughs> with green and blue armpit hair, fine, do what you want. I am not talking to you or sitting next to you on the subway. Right. So don't complain. I don't need no man. No, no man wants you. Because nah. look how you look. I think it's a great point to make, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting point nonetheless. When you look at the whole situation, though, you, you can really divide the women's movement into those three things. And then you can go forward and you can basically start to dissect the problems of modern day feminism. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, I, I criticize the women's movement and I will continue to do so because I just don't think that they have the country's interest at heart. 
You know, they, they align themselves with radical Democrats, radical socialists, radical leftists. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have a lot of these crazy women who have basically yelled and screamed and continue to do so, attacking housewives of today. So women are eating their own. These radical feminists are eating other women. No pun intended. Because <laughs> that was a good joke. You get it? Yeah, yeah. It's a lesbian joke. There you go. Oh! I just want to make sure you hear that. All right, so we. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, like they are attacking other women for being housewives. They're attacking other women for being mothers and taking themselves out of the workforce. And I think a lot of regular women mm -hmm. who typically just want to live their lives uh, are just being attacked as a result of it. And it's not fair. It's not fair to the the you know Midwestern wife, if you will, the traditional American wife who's happy with her lifestyle. And she's being told by the left that she's an evil woman abating patriarchy. It's absolutely disgusting. And, you know, that's really the crux of it. Now, what does this whole feminism thing have to do with Frank Minotaur's book? Well, he goes into detail talking about pretty much how masculinity has been cut. No pun intended. Has been cut uh, by the blank through feminism. Feminism is responsible for a lot of this. Where women aren't allowed... Or rather, men aren't allowed to be who they want to be to the full extent they want to be. You never see cowboys anymore. You know, The leading man in the movies is no longer the John Waynes and the mm -hmm. oh, man. Clark Gables or whatever, you know? Yeah, speaking of the movies, there's nothing with the feminists. This is what I hate. You heard like the Ghostbusters, they're making all female, no, right? They, they, they did. did. They right? Did, yeah. And what else? Was they want to make James Bond a female? No. Or was it? They wanted to make James Bond black, which I still don't understand because you can't turn Superfly white. You can't change James Bond black. Right, same thing doesn't work like things, that. But Ghostbusters, all, all female. Like, come on. It was forced, like you could tell. Like, and yeah. Another thing, too, is there is a disproportionate... I'm going to pull up the statistics a little later on in the program if I have the time. If not, next week, absolutely. But there is a disproportionate amount of gay characters in TV shows today. Oh, like, yeah. you want to talk about just being pushed and shoved down America's throats. Mm -hmm. One ha every Look, I have no problem with the gay character on a storyline. No problem. Whatever. It's okay. And I believe Miley Yiannopoulos talked about this. Uh, who is a gay man, Milo? So, you know, before you call us a racist. But I noticed that never argument. So you have, think about it, you have, watch any TV show you have right now on television. I have no problem with the gay character coming out and, and making, you know, the story richer or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, like, every television show has a gay storyline. And at the same time, every television show... Every movie at this point features prominent gay characters going at it. Oh, it was Steven Crowder. Excuse me, not Miley Yiannopoulos. He wrote a pretty good article on this. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I, I couldn't believe it because he made a great point. He's saying mm -hmm. how, just think about it. For the most part, it's being forced. Just like this Ghostbusters movie was being forced down America's throats. You don't have to remake Ghostbusters to an all-female cast. It does nothing to the storyline. Mm -hmm. Nothing but provide social justice warriors with the ammo they need. It's not really ridiculous. ammo. Not really ammo, but pretty much like the red meat that they want. Ooh, look, women on TV. Go buy some, like, like what is it, Charlie's Angels. Go Charlie, buy some. did you hear this talk right now that one of the women is considered uh, too white and too busty? So the UN banned Wonder Woman. Yeah, I heard something like that. Isn't that ridiculous? They banned Wonder Woman? They banned Wonder Woman. Because she's too busty. Too busty and too white. Don't forget the white part. It's too okay. White. Remember, too it's okay. What does that mean? And we've said this before, and I will say it again. It is okay to be full-blown racist against the white, straight male in today's society. <laughs> but it is not right to be full blown racist against anybody else. And of course, racism is wrong. I should rephrase that sentence. It's not, you know, it's okay to discriminate, rather. It's okay to blame white straight men for your problems. Mm -hmm. It's not okay to blame black culture for the society that they're living in, where 70% of African Americans are born out of wedlock. Uh, and the, the graduation rate in black communities is lower than white communities. And you have more mm -hmm. black on black deaths in the black community than you do in the white community. Right. So the result of that is the UN banning Wonder Woman. Would they want to make her like, what, a black, flat-chested girl? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a transgendered, you know, non-binary, whatever, whatever, you know. I don't know. That, that, that's ridiculous. All, this, all these things. I remember getting into an argument with somebody about this the other day, and they remember saying them to me, um, you know, they asked me about this transsexual thing, and I said, listen, you know, if, if you want to live like that, no one's against it. No one hates you. It's a free country. You can do what you want. We're talking about the validity of what you're doing. And and that really got some people up very upset. They were very, very upset. They said, no, you're born that way. Uh, the same argument with the gay 
argument. And even Miley Annapolis, this one he's right on. He makes the same argument. He goes, you're not really born gay. He goes, I don't care. You know, science has pretty much demonstrated the fact that you're not really born gay. It's really a mixture of nurture and nature. He's not saying it's a choice. He's saying it's sort of a mixture. So one could ask themselves, and, and when asked a question, I thought it was a pretty interesting int- interview. They asked Milo, what do you think about being gay? Would you want to change it? And Milo said he would. Now, I don't think a lot of people out there would. But the reasons he gave, I think, were pretty compelling when he said that, you know, you don't want to live in a society where gay people are marginalized. Why would you choose to be gay when you're going to be different? You know what I mean? Something like that. You don't, you don't yeah. fit in with everybody else. So I think it was a pretty interesting talk from Milo. And, and you know, I, I, I thought it provided some insight into that situation. But the minute you go against the talking point, and let me just give you a quick background and we'll get to the interview. The talking point that, you know, you're born gay, you're born trans, you're born this. Back in the 80s, when they said that we don't hate the lifestyle, we hate the sinner. I'm sorry, we don't, other way around. We don't hate the sinner, we hate the lifestyle. You know, the religious right was running around decrying homosexuality. Blame the game, not the player. Yeah, something like that, which I think is ridiculous. You know, leave people alone. But nonetheless, they were running around, and that's the argument that they were trying to make. Uh, It was Milo who saw that the gay... um, the gay interest groups, if you will, mm-hmm. they got together and they were saying, well, what if we just say we were born this way? And if we were born this way, you can't really do anything about it. And therefore, you're a bigot if you're against it. So it would be like being racist. You're born black. Can't do anything about it. You're born gay. Right. Can't do anything about it. So I thought it was a pretty good thing. And then that's pretty much what they've been labeling against you. So if you if you even come to terms with just saying, we don't even know if you are born gay. Science has not settled that issue. They're quick to attack. Right. Anyway, I thought it was pretty good stuff. Frank Minotaur talks about this all in his book. Um, it is it is a wonderful book. Um, this Will Make a Man Out of You, One Man's Search for What Makes Men. He talks about this stuff. Uh, it's the book that's coming out. This Will Make a Man Out of You, One Man's Search for What Makes Men. And we're going to play the interview, go to break, come back, talk about Trump and the Electoral College. Don't go anywhere on the Vito and Vito Show. It's about manning up to become the people we really want to be, to build that character that this society has been tearing down for so long. You know, I looked around and I said, as a journalist, let me answer the question, what makes men? And I was drawn to go and do one of the, well, one of the coolest things you could do on this planet, I think, to go run with those bulls in Pamplona. And to do that, I ch- actually chased Hemingway from those steward cafes in Paris uh, to the streets of Pamplona during the running of the bulls. And I did every part of that. And let me tell you, I even, I even did the suicide run right at the beginning where you run at the bulls uh, to prove my crazy part of manhood. So, you no, know, it was there and it was fun. Yeah, that's what I'm getting to with this proving yourself, whether it's running with the bulls or climbing cliffs or jumping out of a, an airplane, whatever it is you, you want to do. It doesn't have to be something that extreme, of course, but it's that reality. It's that getting out of these alternate universes, whether it's in academia, which is, is going to be terrible these days, uh, or it's, it's just in social media or just playing video games or Hollywood, when you have to actually step out and do something real that tests you, something you can actually really fail at to grow up into something. And if you do that, in a way that also pushes you into chasing an ideal, to living upon a code, a real code of honor, then you really start to go into a man. And th- that's the kind of thing I found in Pamplona with this group of people who chases the Hemingway persona, who tries to be that ideal bull runner, but actually lives in, in, by a code. Because if you, when you're on the street, if you do the wrong things, you can get people hurt. So you actually have to follow those kinds of values you find. And it, it's surprising when they're there. I mean, if you actually distract a bull or grab a bull or do something, you get that bull turned around, he'll start to kill people in that street. He'll start to really hurt people. So there's a value system that's even built into that. Any kind of man thing really has that. And you see that in, in today's society where a lot of this youth and a lot of these college kids we have just haven't been given those chances, been taken away from them, but even by their parents, not letting them grow up. A lot of parents actually bring the level down to their kids instead of rising their kids up to something. Uh, so, you know, you have these kids out there today who just haven't been given that chance, those real fun things to do to grow themselves into what they want to be. Yeah, I mean, I, that happens to be probably one of the biggest things going on right now. 
in regards to young college men and just the things they do. And I think I listen to this video. There's so many of them. Uh, young college people who are just liberal. But when I mean liberal, not like Democrat or liberal, like just like, eh, whatever, just like they're really pushing their point and they're liberal. I'm talking like the woke extreme. Where a lot of these <laughs> kids are focused on literally holding signs saying, I'm sorry. I mean, how many times have you seen these pictures of just white guys or just guys in general holding signs saying, I'm sorry? Because you're being well, there's something. It's not their point, you know? It's just like they're being well, told that the college is a force for one thing. Right, they're being indoctrinated. And that's why I, I talk about reality. I mean, you don't find many liberal cowboys. You know, they're, de- they're dealing with something real when they, when they deal with horses and bulls and all that kind of stuff. You don't find many liberal firemen. They're dealing with real things. When people get out there and start to do things, they grow up. Um, unfortunately, too many people today can live in these alternate rea- realities throughout their life. They work for the government or they work for some big corporation. They can stay in those little places and be these kind of girly men. But you, know, you can't trust those kind of people. I've had so many women come to me after they read my, my book and stuff and say, where do I find this guy, this gentleman, this stand-up person, this person I can trust? All I have around me are these, these little girly men, these boy men. Well, and here's the thing. Why is it that aspiration, because it's no longer okay to be masculine. I mean, you know, saying I like sports and I like, you know, being rough and tough. And we saw what Donald Trump said, you know, in regards to, you know, kind of locking in the party a couple months ago. That's all considered baggy, little disgusting filth, you know, kind of chauvinistic, whatever. So how do we – What? why is masculinity so bad, and, and what's the alternative if you need to wrestle down a bad guy? Because it's a threat to feminism, and it, as they see it, it isn't real. It's not a threat to equality, but as they see it, and it's a threat to this liberal utopia they want to set up. Because somebody who can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, you know, that old saying, is an individual. That person doesn't need the nanny state to come and coddle them and help them up and give them a, a little safe space on their college campus. That person is going to go and do something. And that actually frightens the left. That individual frightens the left. They want somebody who's going to be controlled, with it, be, it, be a sheep for them, uh, through the social programs and everything they want to do. They're there to help you. That's the way they see it. So somebody who can stand up, and this is why guns scare the hell out of them. I mean, the second them, the individual right to bear arms, that a person can actually defend their own life with a firearm, for them is so crazy. They just can't even conceive of it. That scares them, that individual would have that kind of power. But that's the American system. That's what's made America into what we are, and that's what they're destroying. I mean, that's the extreme side of it, but they are piece by piece tearing it down. I mean, they've been doing this for more than a half century now, feminism, just pulling out all the things that used to be what made a man. And what are they left men with? Nothing. They're not supposed to be men, and then give them nothing else in return. They're supposed to be, what, women, something else? Meanwhile, they've left women in, a, in an equal state. Are they supposed to be men? Are they supposed to be something else? They don't believe – they don't go according to this liberal kind of ideal of what makes a feminist a feminist today. If they're conservative but strong and believe in equality, well, then they can't be a feminist. So, they're, again, they're caught in between somewhere. This is where they left uh, this generation. Right. So now here's the question. What is masculinity? If you could define it, because we don't know what it is, right? It's one, like, clear definition is what's arguably against the left, so that we're not left out in the trend. And then there's the poll that we've been pointing out. What is masculine thinking? And, and, and for that matter, what is femininity if you could define a well, okay. I, I define masculine manualness uh, as according to character. So I don't even put gender in there. It, it's a person who's honorable and stands up on a code, who will do the right thing no matter what, and has the strength and bearing to do that. That's manly. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. But you see a car accident, and Pee Wee Herman shows up, and an NFL linebacker shows up, and the NFL linebacker is crying and just can't, just falling apart. Well, who's more manly? If Pee Wee Herman's there putting on the tourniquet and calling 911. So it isn't physique. It, it only, I don't even think it's gender. I mean, I've hunted dangerous game with women. I've climbed cliffs with women. I've run the bulls in Pamplona with women. And I've found that some of them were tougher than the men around them. So I'd look at it as a question of character. So it's that person who can stand up with a strong back and do what's right no matter what. That's what's manly. Okay, so now what's, fem- um, what, what's feminine then? You know, I think a, a feminine woman who could be strong is just the ultimate in femininity. I mean, she's powerful. She's strong. But she's also a lady. She also... Is, is attractive to the male, to the opposite sex. I mean, she's not afraid to be a woman. Yet, why does that make her weak? I don't think it should. I think that's that's a that's a false premise, and I, and I think it's unfortunate that we put ourselves there in society and say these things are opposites when they're not. So I I, I think a woman can be feminine and be strong, and a man could be masculine and strong without being a chauvinist. I think if a man has to put down women in order to prop up his own ego, well then he's too weak, he's too insecure to be a real man anyway. So a, a real gentleman isn't that way to begin with. So I, I think we're uh, from the beginning we're dealing with bad definitions. Okay, well, I, I agree with that. So are you saying that masculinity, just to, like, just to clarify, masculinity is a, a, a 
responsible for this gender, right? Well, I, 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 would, I would say masculinity and femininity are specific to gender, but I want to turn manliness, and I'm, sep I'm separating that out. Uh, and our language just hasn't caught up with where we are. I think we need to actually come up with new terms, but I mean, that makes me sound very politically correct in anything but. But I think we do because there's so much baked into what we – when we say man or woman, there's so much baked into these things that people assume. And I, I think it's just an unfortunate. You've got to start by defining all these terms. Right. <laughs> There's no shortage of porn out there. There's no shortage of porn. But actually, Playboy has a certain point of view, and that point of view has been hidden from us. I mean, you know, you have to open the cellophane package. You got in a lot of places. You got to ask for it. It's in a place where kids can't get it. So it was kept out of at arm's reach. So it wasn't having the social impact I think it could have with this gentlemanly message that vices aren't necessarily bad. See, vices are, are there to refine us as men. You know, having a drink doesn't make you manly. It's knowing how much to drink or how much not to drink that makes you manly. And that's the kind of viewpoint you get from Playboy. But I think by having the, the, the pornography in there, it just wasn't having the impact in society it could have. Oh, it got so tame, though. I mean, it became, yeah, I don't know. That's true. That's true. <laughs> You have to, with understanding, people have to read, they have to think. Uh, we, we need maybe movies that actually, I mean, did you see the latest band, Her? We I mean, talk about a girly man in the lead role. It just didn't work, and I, I don't think they understood that. You watch, watch the old classic with Charlton Heston. It worked because he was that stand-up manly guy, and I don't think that they got that. And, and it's having those roles and getting that stuff, that stuff out there and that understanding with people, that hunger for that. There's a huge hunger now for what makes a man. People are asking this question all over the place, often with the wrong answers, but they're at least trying to ask these questions. So I see a lot of hope. I think over the next generation, this, these answers will start to come and, as we search for them, because now they've thrown us into a dark room and said you can't be anything. Well, that's not going to work. We're going to look for a light. We're going to go someplace. I think people are starting to do that now. Absolutely. Have you seen the new Ghostbusters yet? With the <laughs> no, no, no. Well, he's like he's iconic, but I, I don't mind if they if they if it's a black guy or a Hispanic guy. I don't that doesn't bother me at all if it's the right kind of dude, but it does bother me if it's suddenly a woman. I mean, or, or if it's an outwardly gay gay man. I mean, nothing against against people of that sexual orientation, but they you know James Bond is not that. He's a ladies' man. Uh, so so I agree with you there. Well, this to make a man of you is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, really wherever books are sold. Um, you know, and I'm known in this genre. I, I also did a book in New York Times bestseller called The Ultimate Man Survival Guide, which has all the skills a man should know. So I, I've been doing this for a long time. You can find me in lots of places, but frankminister.com is my website. I do a column for Forbes and for – well, I write for a lot of people. So if you Google me, you'll find lots of stuff.
Hey, what's what? I just break miniatures. I make it easy. Yeah, I mean, I, I usually I usually drink bourbon. I mean, if I'm going to drink beer, it's it's dark. But that's just me. I I try not to judge by drinks. But right, if you're drinking something fruity and and you're not in an island somewhere, there's something wrong with you. Sure is. Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke and you could save. Your friend, teacher, boss. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T. That's F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in the recovery of... Your neighbor, the waiter, grandmother, grandfather. So learn F-A-S-T, the sudden signs of a stroke. Then pass it on, because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to mooch off your friends. You gonna finish that grape? You mean the one in my mouth? You don't need to stop buying the necessities. What you're smelling is a natural musk. Ew. You don't need to be a medical test subject. How do you feel? Mostly okay. I... (laughs) Sometimes, though. (laughs) You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman. Let's break for lunch. You just need an internet connection. Don't get left behind. Start your personal savings plan with the tips and tools on feedthepig.org. That way, you don't need to sell your soul to the devil. Fifteen bucks is the best I can do. All right, deal. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs, the California Society of CPAs, and the Ad Council. Fighting the Common Core Standards? Need a powerful tool to help inform others on this harmful education initiative? You're covered with Common Ground on Common Core, the collection of essays by 20 top education experts and activists. Reviewers call it the best single resource on the topic. You can share it with literally anyone. Order your print or digital copy of Common Ground on Common Core today. Just visit resoundingbooks.org. That's resoundingbooks.org. And get $2 off when you tell them Vito and Vito sent you. Paid for by Resounding Books Pack. It's important to plan ahead for emergencies, like Like the storm. storm. When it kicked in, we had a plan. We were able to get in touch with each other in no time. Find each other. The whole experience was was the most frightening 10 hours of my life. If there's one piece of advice I'd offer other moms out there, it's to stay calm and keep to the plan. Some parents plan ahead. Some don't. Make sure you know where to find your family in an emergency. Start your plan at readypa.org. Brought to you by Ready PA, FEMA, and the Ad Council. And we're back here on the Vito and Vito Show. How we doing? Check out the website, www.vito1vito.com. Give us a follow Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Vito and Vito Show. Uh, that was our interview with Frank Minotaur. Great interview good friend and a pleasure to have on check out the book this will make a man out of you one man search for what makes men uh talk about american masculinity today here we go all right next topic of conversation on the agenda there's a push ladies and gentlemen uh for electors to defect away for voting from donald trump with the electoral college set to meet next week millions of americans horrified by the prospect of a donald j trump presidency 
have implored red state electors to vote for Hillary Clinton or an establishment Republican. Millions of Americans supportive of Mr. Trump find these efforts galling, but both sides agree on what makes such electors faithless. It's called a faithless elector. That's from the New York Times. I read that from an article. Uh, it's from the opinion pages. I don't know if that matters. Uh, and it was from David Posen. Why the GOP Electoral College members can vote against Trump? In other words, what, these, what the left is seeking to do in their last push to deny Trump the presidency and deny millions upon millions upon millions of people who want change, uh, they want Donald Trump not to win, and they're going to do everything they can to try to stop that, and they need electors to defect away and vote. Vote for Hillary Clinton or an, an outsider candidate uh, a third-party candidate, rather, an establishment Republican. They can do whatever they want, the electors. Once they get there, they can vote whoever they want to. Typically, they vote however their state voted. So, Donald Trump won Florida. 29 electoral votes should go to Donald Trump. Uh, if you get enough Republicans to switch over, mm-hmm. you can pretty much deny Donald Trump the presidency, and it's all constitutional. What do you think? Oh, but do you see this happening? No, not at all. This is just, to me, it's like, this is ridiculous that they're trying to do this. And the best part about this all, I mean, it's so funny, because all we heard from the left, when they were so sure Donald Trump was going to lose, was that Hillary Clinton, or Donald Trump, needs to accept the results of the election. Has to accept the results of the election. Well, the the hypocrites. Hypocrites, please. We haven't a clue. It's unbelievable. (laughs) I mean, this is like blatantly hypocritical. Why can't you accept the votes of an election that are perfectly fine? Now, the argument the left is making is that Donald Trump lost the popular vote. And honestly, and this is my argument, I can give a damn what the popular vote numbers are. I don't care about the popular vote. I don't care what way it swings. I don't really care who wins the popular vote. It doesn't matter. The Constitution was not set up for the popular vote to win. Well, it's not pure democracy. Pretty much. The same, on the other hand, also... Uh, the do- um, a lot of celebrities are coming out. Martin Sheen being one of them, and I like him. He's a good actor. I hate when celebrities do this because Rob- I like a lot of yeah, them. Yeah, Robert De Niro. I love De Niro. He's all right. I don't know. You talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I thought he was great. I still do. I think he's a great actor. I don't like his comments. He's absolutely amazing. His comments on Trump, I can't agree with. Sorry. Like Cher. I love Cher. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, anyway, so a lot of celebrities are coming out and basically bashing uh, Donald Trump. And at the same time, they're, they're trying to encourage electors to become faithless and vote their conscience. That's the new thing now. Vote their conscience. How oh, funny is that? Where did that come from? Isn't that silly? <laughs> vote your conscience. Anyway, so as they steal Ted Cruz's line to vote your conscience, uh, you have a lot of the people, these electors, seeking another candidate. And frankly... Uh, the the left is using a lot of these celebrities are using a line in the Constitution that pretty much says that the position of the president is to be held for somebody who is competent and willing and qualified. Um, this I'm paraphrasing it, but you pretty much get the point. Well, the left seems with their <coughs> excuse me with their wealth of knowledge to basically discredit Donald Trump because he's not qualified to be president. He has no experience. You know, they're going to give you the whole runaround. But I find it funny when. The people, these are celebrities supposed to represent the people's voices, so they say. They say they're representing the people's voices. Uh, but they're not really representing the people's voices when the people voted for Donald Trump. And don't give me this crap, the popular vote, that Hillary Clinton won by 2 million votes. I don't care. You know where she got those 2 million votes from. Probably half of them are illegals. But anyway, I'll even give it the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, Hillary Clinton got 2 million more votes than Donald mm-hmm. Trump. She got 2 million more votes in California and got 2 million more votes in New York City. Period. End of story. The rest of the country shifted. And they did a recount. Did a recount in she Wisconsin. lost some votes. They did a recount in Wisconsin, uh, and she wound up losing Michigan as well. Uh, yeah. I think it's interesting to see that the more and more we continue to hear about this crap, the more and more we continue to see the left push on the American people that they're not smart enough to pick the president. They're not smart enough to root for somebody like Donald Trump. They're not smart enough to vote Republican. That's not fair. That's not. That's disrespectful. That's one of the reasons why they lost. People are tired of the elitism, the smug, uh, the pretentious liberal. 
the one that wears a beret in the middle of Starbucks drinking a coffee that's probably worth a lot more than it should be. A raspberry beret? A raspberry beret. He's got a pencil-thin mustache. It might be a woman. It might not even have a gender anymore. <laughs> Sitting in Starbucks, carrying around the typewriter instead of a laptop because they think that it's cool wearing some ginormous home rim glasses. And they have a beard. They have a beard that is as big as a rabbi's. Writers. And everyone's a writer. All writing something. Or an artist. Or a painter. Or a... I don't know. None of them actually work. They live off their parents' money. And they went to very expensive schools with a degree in basket weaving and a minor <laughs> in aquatic <laughs> swim lessons. So, honestly, <laughs> none of these people have any sort of societal good. But at the same time, these are the people who somehow <laughs> believe that they are much smarter than you. They believe they know what to do with your life better than what you know what to do with it. So I frankly believe that is the most disrespectful thing. It goes back to the argument about masculinity. You're not allowed to be a man anymore. You're not allowed. It's not okay. You kidding me? This is the argument I hear from these idiots. And these family, I think they're hypocrites. I think a, a good amount of them are hypocrites because they say, oh, you know, you have to, you can be, you can cry, you know, you can show your emotions. And then, God forbid, a man is not so burly, manly a man. And the women are like, oh, I want a man's man. Uh, you know, and then they're all hypocrites and they go back on their word. So men are screwed here, especially if you're white and straight. Yep. You're screwed. It's the scapegoat. That's what has become. The left has created the scapegoat. And this whole quote-unquote rape escape- culture. Mm-hmm. That God forbid you look at a woman the oh, wrong way when no. she's passing by. Nah. Oh my God, he raped me with his eyes. That's it. This is the argument. Okay, this th- is then the that crap. comes about these like the California laws that you know they say you have to verbally ask and receive permission before you make any advancements physically with the woman at any point during the night. Is this okay? Or in bed? Is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? <laughs> <laughs> like really? Unbelievable. I was actually watching a show recently. It was left on the TV. I don't like this stuff. And one of the girls was complaining on college on her campus that they need those kind of California laws. And another woman spoke out against it, saying that ruins the whole intimacy, yada, yada, yada. You can't have those things. And they completely went after this woman. Like, no, you need these California laws. You need to protect the women. The rape See, culture, the they're key, going after that's, women. That's the key word. You need this. You need. You need. You. You need. As if I can't decipher my own needs. It's very disrespectful. And frankly, the more and more I continue to hear these conversations from the left, this this notion that you know Donald Trump doesn't deserve the presidency. Wh- who are you to determine if he doesn't deserve the presidency? You didn't win. You don't get to determine if he can deserve it or not. You voiced your opinion, and your opinion wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. There weren't enough people to agree with you. More people disagreed with you. And do not give me the popular vote. I don't care. Donald Trump has a mandate to get in office and do what he wants to do. So long as the Congress works with him. Hopefully. Let's also keep in mind, when they say that he doesn't have a mandate, that Donald Trump, that the Republicans, under the Donald Trump sweep, took a majority of state legislatures, took a majority of governorships, took a majority of House seats when they were supposed to lose seats in the House, took a majority of the Senate when they were supposed to lose seats this time because the map was against Republicans, and the White House. Republicans are in the best shape they've been in, in terms of legislative control, since the 1920s. Doesn't matter. They have a mandate. And it's a big one, and Donald Trump has a lot of big things he has to fill. Uh, we're going to go to break real soon, then we're going to get to forget about a moment. But before we do that, I just want to jump on the Rex Tillerson appointment. Donald Trump choosing Rex Tillerson. Uh, he's the ExxonMobil CEO. Uh, and and the Times and and all I love it how these liberal networks are finally going after Russia. Like they, it took them years to finally call out Russia. Now they're finally doing it. They, they think about it, Vito. The, the the New York Times, CNN. They're saying Rex Tillerson is gonna, you know, make us friendly with Russia. We can't allow it. Bernie Sanders is attacking. Bernie Sanders out of all people. <laughs> I, I just don't understand this. It's so funny because I would never have thought I would have never thought the Russians and the Democrats were going to be against each other as much as they are. It's very funny. It happens. Yeah, it happens. Right, so, what do you think of Rex? Go ahead. What do you think of the Secretary of State? Trust? You know, I've heard so many different things. You know, is it good or is it bad? He's friends with Russia. This and that. Exxon Mobil. I heard. As Secretary of State, is he going to be able to put sanctions or do anything against Russia that affects the oil after being CEO of Exxon? 
seems like conflict of interest. Then again, do you go ahead and trust Donald Trump's judgment? I mean... Well, look, put it like this. If you go after Russia and you have Rex Tillerson, who is the CEO of ExxonMobil, his ties to Russia, because he has business deals over there, are certainly Mm -hmm. questionable. At the same time, the number one thing the Russians have is energy. And if you're able to use somebody like Tillerson, who has expertise in energy, against the Russians, that could help. But again, what could you use him for? Uh, you know Trump didn't just make this pick out of you know the back of his hat. The guy obviously thought and deliberated on this pick because it is such an important pick. This is the chief diplomat uh, next to the president. So one has to wonder just what he can do. But we'll see uh, what Rex Tillerson stands for and what he wants to do. Um, I, I, I look forward. This is the one thing. This is the one position I look forward to. Because you just need three Republicans to defect away. Like, and Rand Paul, John McCain, uh, you know, they said they're not going to vote for him. Lindsey Graham said he doesn't like him. So that could be enough senators to deny this guy the post. I'm curious to see what the confirmation hearing is going to be like. That's something I'm going to watch. Because there's really nothing else I really care about. I mean, who's there? What? Uh, you know, Mike Flynn. Okay, Secretary I like him. Secretary of Interior, Vito. What? Uh, what's his name? Zinke. Zinke, Matt Zinke. I got no problem with that. We know. We interviewed him a couple Terrific. times. Terrific. So I like uh, And congratulations. I got no problem. He's great. I got no problem with a lot of these guys. What I'm curious to know about is the Secretary of State position, and I want to know, I really want to know how the Senate is going to confirm him, what they're going to question him on, and if they're going to confirm him at all. And if they don't, who's the second pick? We're going to break here on the Vito Vito Show. Don't go anywhere. Forget about it. Hey, Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke, and you could save. Your friend, teacher, boss. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T. That's F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in the recovery of... Your neighbor, the waiter, grandmother, grandfather. So learn FAST, the sudden signs of a stroke. Then pass it on, because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. It may be hard to believe, but people just like you are already saving money. FeedThePig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to mooch off your friends. You gonna finish that grape? You mean the one in my mouth? You don't need to stop buying the necessities. What you're smelling is a natural musk. Ew. You don't need to be a medical test subject. How do you feel? Mostly okay. I... (laughs) Sometimes, though. (laughs) You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman. Let's break for lunch. You just need an internet connection. Don't get left behind. Start your personal savings plan with the tips and tools on feedthepig.org. That way, you don't need to sell your soul to the devil. Fifteen bucks is the best I can do. All right, deal. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs, the California Society of CPAs, and the Ad Council. Fighting the Common Core Standards? Need a powerful tool to help inform others on this harmful education initiative? You're covered with Common Ground on Common Core, the collection of essays by 20 top education experts and activists. Reviewers call it the best single resource on the topic. You can share it with literally anyone. Order your print or digital copy of Common Ground on Common Core today. Just visit resoundingbooks.org. That's resoundingbooks.org. And get $2 off when you tell them Vito and Vito sent you. Paid for by Resounding Books Pack. It's important to plan ahead for emergencies, like the storm. When it kicked in, we had a plan. We were able to get in touch with each other in no time. idea how to find each other. The whole experience was was the most frightening 10 hours of my life. If there's one piece of advice I'd offer other moms out there, it's to stay calm and keep to the plan. Some parents plan ahead. Some don't. Make sure you know where to find your family in an emergency. Start your plan at readypa.org. Brought to you by Ready PA, FEMA, and the Ad Council. Hey, 
And we're back here on the Vito and Vito show. Check out the website www.vitoandvito.com. And it's about that time of the week, Vito. What? Forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Oh, forget about it. Hey, you talk right in the middle of the clip of playing too. See, this is why, you know, usually you talk, you press the button, then you talk. Yeah, you're doing it right. I mean, it's hard to see from behind the desk where you're clicking on. Well, we were gonna stick you in another room. <laughs> I see. <laughs> we're gonna stick you in another room. Make you do the shoot from there. And I was gonna disconnect your microphone. It's gonna be the Vito show. That would have been nice, right? It's a nice ring to it. Oh. Vito show, right? As long as you click the button. It's like Arsenio oh, Hall, right? Arsenio Hall, the Vito show. Arsenio Hall, the Vito. I like it. Two brothers. Okay, what do you got? <laughs> Ha ha. Ha ha. Go ahead, Vito. What do you got? Ha ha. Forget about it, most, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know her. There you go. We break down some of the craziest moments this past week, uh, whether in the world of politics, just the world in general. And we have a saying in Brooklyn that's called, forget about it. And that's when we say that the world is going under, and I'm just so embarrassed as to what's going on. So, Vito, what do you got? Come on. I'm glad you remembered your lines. Mm, okay. The White House Chief of Staff. Hmm. Friends previous. Current yeah, or new? The current one. Oh, okay. Dennis McDonough. Mm-hmm. He told David Axelrod on his podcast, no, he said that Obama, the winner. Go ahead. he said Obama is the most Catholic president in history. Most Catholic president? He's Catholic? Yes. No, that's the funny thing. Oh. <laughs> you know who was a Catholic president? JFK. Which would probably make him the most Catholic, <laughs> since he was a Catholic. What, what, would, what spurred that thing? Let me look this up. Hold on. What? Okay, what do you have on this story, Vito? Tell me. Well, he said that he's the most Catholic, and he says not by what he does every day, mm-hmm. and um, he doesn't do everything consistent with the Catholic teaching, but he was a very spiritual man growing up, and he found his religion when he got older, and yada, 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 became a big religious guy, conv- uh, conveniently to win over is, the majority is, of the country. Uh, is that um, documentary up on Netflix, Barry? You all see this? The Barry documentary? Right. Yeah, it's supposed to be Obama's documentary of him, like, growing up. Because <laughs> this guy's got, like, six biographies. Autobiographies. He's got, like, six, seven, eight autobiographies. He's got maybe, I don't know, two or three different movies about his life, different parts when he was growing up. Uh, you know, he's got more articles and short stories written about him than anything else. This guy is a mythical character. It's unbelievable. Okay? Unbelievable. James Bond has less stories written about him than Barack Obama. It's absolutely <laughs> insane. This guy, it, it, it's before he's 40 years old, he had more stories than anything else. But anyway, Barack, um, the, the movie's called Barry. It's out on Netflix. Um, I'm curious to see if it is out. I think it is. I'm not so sure. Go check it out. This is 2016. Uh, but I, I do want to see it. I do want to see it. It's about him growing up, and I'm curious to see if, uh, you know, I, I like how it humanizes Barack Obama. Because that's what these things are. They're, they're an attempt to humanize, you know. Right. Make him more relatable, so you can right. so you can look back and say, For "Yeah, that was a term? good president, huh?" For his third term, wouldn't be surprised if he signs an executive order to do so. What else you got there, Vito? Well, did you know? That, you remember Dylan Roof, the guy who shot up right the like, church? Yes, was it in, in, in North Carolina, South Carolina? Yes, North okay. Carolina. Go ahead. Yes, um, from one of the Carolinas. <laughs> recently, East Carolina. Go ahead. Recently, he decided to be his own lawyer, which is a little shock. I don't know why this kid, young kid, will want to be his own lawyer. So he went to court uh, this week, and surprisingly, he lost. He's a nut job. Yeah, he, uh, they found him every account, and he's going to be in jail for a very long time. Good enough. They should give him the chair. 33 federal crimes. Unbelievable. Um, what a disgrace. So what an, that, that guy, an absolute disgrace. I don't see how any, any lawyer could really defend him. I mean, aside from Hillary Clinton, because that's what she does. <laughs> But he's a nut job, this kid. Like, there's nothing wrong with him. He needs to be institutionalized. Yeah. Uh, and it's unfortunate that he did what he did. But, uh, you know. Yeah, well, he's going to jail or the chair or whatever. Not, you know, uh, for the mentally ill because he does, he defended himself. I want to know what he said. Like, how can you defend yourself? Like. Did he plead not guilty? Yeah. Not guilty? He pled not guilty. Not guilty, mm. I believe. Because yeah. that's. Got the wrong guy. All right, what else you got? Yeah, 33 counts. <laughs> Go ahead. And then finally, Vito, this might interest you. Uh, apparently the New York Post reported this, that they found out why human males don't have bones in their penises, but other mammals do. Why did they have to research it? Go ahead. I don't know, but this is probably taxpayer money. Uh, probably. Probably. But a new study suggests that uh, monogamy and the short length of human sex 
may be the reason why men don't have bones and penises. Well, the mammals, like bears, chimps, and gorillas do. Um, and it shows that those animals have right. sex for much longer than men, human men, which is longer than three minutes on average. <laughs> so we're not looking good as a species here. Well, you know what? <laughs> you must be pumping something. I don't know. I, well, I, I, whatever. Kinda, what that says to science or how that affects my day, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't have a bone in my penis, uh, uh, yeah. uh, d- despite certain slang words. <laughs> uh, did you know? Here's one for you. I don't really contribute to forget about it. Come to think of it, I don't really contribute to anything. But if we look at forget about it moments, uh, here's one. Facebook is, uh, did you hear this? That they're employing fact checkers like uh, Snopes.com. Snoops, whatever it's called. Snoop Snoop you know, the absolutely ridiculous leftist organization who is pent up on destroying any sort of Republican. Uh, the other one, PolitiFact, to investigate, comb through Facebook, and pick out fake news. Believe that? You know, first it was you're racist and you're sexist, then you're a homophobe, now, then you're transphobic, now it's fake news. So anything you don't agree with them, you're something else. Democrats have well, blamed fake news, racism, sexism. They've blamed white people. They've blamed uh, uh, privilege. They've blamed everything else and anything else but the fact that Barack Obama was a terrible president and Hillary Clinton is a horrific candidate. That's the problem. Right, but if Unbelievable. It's a- if it's actual fake news, like you're going around telling people Hugh Hefner died. No, I don't care. The market will set itself out. The people will see it. They will not look at it, and then they will never click on that source again. Do you know how many times I hear my mom at night? Oh, my God, did you hear Hugh Hefner died? So then you laugh about it and say, ha, 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 and you look at the ad just for next time, and you'll be safe. This is you do not go out there and start. Who is Facebook to start censoring and determining what is news? It's not for them. And you know, Facebook has a history of going after conservatives. You know, they're going to go after this show. They're probably going to go after other conservative shows. Sure, this is fake news, but not a news show. Well, I don't know. What are we? Uh, we are. We're a blank show. Fill in the blank. Turn us in next week. Vito, Vito and Vito. Vito. Go to the website www.vitoandvito.com. Give us a follow. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Vito and Vito Show.